We're joined now by Dr. Sebastian Craves, co-founder of Mini PCR Bio. Dr. Craves, can you talk a little bit about the moment or, or what influenced the spark that you have for your love of, of biology, um, particularly when you, at the tender age of 12, read Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle? That's a great question. I was uh, age 12, growing up in Argentina, when my grandmother, who was a big history buff, gave me this book, which was fascinating to her because being into uh, the Victorian era, she was really fascinated by how Darwin uh, navigating around the globe came to Argentina and Patagonia. Um, so I opened it up with no expectations. And instead of getting hooked on the history, I got hooked on the biology because and it was in this trip that Darwin started gathering all the pieces, all the evidence that shaped up his theory of evolution. And it was something I had not been exposed to before. And it was just mind blowing to understand that the connectedness of life and how all living things are woven together through evolution. So I really wanted to know how that worked. And you have a history, you know, you've turned this passion into bringing biomedical technology around the world for global health purposes. Can you talk about a project that was particularly challenging or impactful? I worked for many years as a consultant to global health organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, and all these projects were all around bringing medical technologies to low research settings. One of them was uh, particularly around malaria and how we combat infectious disease in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. Uh, it turns out that our main line of therapy against malaria is based on a natural product. It's called artemisinin. Natural product means it grows from a plant. And as fascinating as that is from a biology standpoint, it's a terrible economic proposition because any given year, you're not going to know how many people are going to need treatment for malaria and how much of this artemisinin are we going to be able to produce. And so we were tasked with forecasting the need for artemisinin and its production potential every year until synthetic biology came to the rescue. So now it turns out we understand the genes that the plant uses to produce artemisinin, and we're able to engineer those genes into yeast to produce artemisinin synthetically. That very much addresses the need for malaria treatment. That's fascinating. Um, can you walk us through how mini PCR bio simplifies complex scientific concepts for educational purposes without diluting the core science at hand? I'd say it starts with understanding the need, identifying the gaps in technology that prevent something from reaching classrooms. But once that is done, the real hard work begins. And we have a large team of engineers, biologists, scientists, uh, manufacturers who think about how we can strip it down to its bare essentials. So take PCR, which is at the heart of our company. Uh, in PCR, the bare minimum is to be able to heat and cool DNA with programmable precision. So once you understand that, you can remove all the layers, you can peel back the onion uh, of what's not needed, what's just getting in the way of making a product functional, accessible, easy to use, and cheap to produce. And that's what we invest most of our time in. PTC tasting is a well-known uh, genetic marker for taste perception. Can you talk a little bit about how this, this testing helps students understand the link between genotype and phenotype? PC tasting is one of my favorite classroom experiments because it can so directly do that. And it starts with our perception of the world. As, as much as we'd like to romanticize our, our sensory systems and how we smell and taste and, and perceive the world, it's all filtered through molecules, which are genetically encoded. So in PTC tasting, we take one of these molecules that encodes uh, taste perception, in particular, perception of a very bitter chemical, that's PTC. I'm not going to try to pronounce its chemical name. Uh, but what happens is that very, very small differences in the gene that encodes PTC uh, can render one able to taste this bitter chemical or completely indifferent to it. So the experiment starts with students doing just that, putting a little bit of PTC in their mouth and noticing how some have the ability to taste it, and they're going to be cringing at the taste of it, and others are just not going to care at all. Uh, and then we go on to show students that they can read the genetic information that encodes this gene in themselves and be able to see how a very small difference in a very long string of DNA, just two or three changes, can make one able to perceive or not uh, bitter, which informs our entire world uh, perception. 
And I like to remind students too that this is the exception rather than the rule. Most of our sensory experience, most of our life experience is shaped by the environment and not encoded in our genes. This is one of the examples where it's encoded in our genes. So CRISPR has been a revolutionary tool in teaching genetics. What are some ethical considerations you discuss with educators when introducing this technology into their classrooms? CRISPR is in the process of transforming the world that our students live in, and being able to teach it is phenomenal uh, and very important, too. When you think about the ethical considerations, because CRISPR can do so, so much, it can, you know, it can cure disease, you can rewrite uh, your genetic information, I'd say where most scientists draw the line, where the moral compass lies, is our ability to create heritable change. So one thing is to take a patient, say someone who has sickle cell, and correct a genetic defect that leads to that disease by rewriting genetic information in those cells involved in the disease, in this case, red blood cells. A very, very different scenario is one where you genetically modify your reproductive organs. Um, that's what we call germline gene editing, and that's what can create the potential to rewrite genetic information for the entire human species. So that's where uh, teachers need to introduce students to that distinction, one we call somatic gene editing, and that's very powerful as a therapeutic tool. Germline gene editing is where we mess with genes that we're going to pass on to the next generation with all that it can imply for things like genetic improvement or eugenics. So what are the challenges of translating concepts like PCR and CRISPR into these kits for classrooms? Um, As a biologist, by training, trying to do engineering of hardware tools, I've learned that engineering can be very hard and one ought to be very patient. You may have a great idea, what we call a concept, and then you've got it validated functionally in what we call a prototype. And that's not even half the battle. You've got to make it work not just once, but reproducibly thousands or hundreds of thousands of times. And that's a really fun challenge of making, making tools, making uh, biotechnology tools. But conversely, as, you know, as a genetic engineer trying to bring advanced genetics into the classroom, you deal with complexity. You know, something like CRISPR has just so many different angles. So what our team tries to do really, really hard is, again, just peeling it back to its very fundamental mechanisms so that we can exemplify those without losing authenticity and helping build a a close understanding of what a technology is, not what it can do or what its implications can be, but just what it is at its core. Lastly, I would say the real agents of change in, an, in any education scene are the teachers that are going to bring this technology to the students. So the majority of our ongoing effort is in enabling, empowering, training those teachers. Well, that's what I was going to ask. You know, lastly, what, where do you see the future of biotechnology education and what role do you see mini PCR bio playing in that future? I, I think uh, as, a, as an industry, we ought to think about shortening the gap, closing the gap between what is possible in a professional lab and how we're training the next generation that's going to have those jobs. For example, we, we did that for PCR. When we brought PCR to classrooms, uh, there was a 30-year delay between its inception and your ability to do it as a student. For CRISPR, we shortened that to 10 years. So I would say the future is about accelerating the deployment of these technologies in the classroom so that more students can be ready for the future. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Krebs. Thank you so much.